Well, I had the I graduated from uh, University of Oregon at the, the time it was the University of Oregon Dental School in 1969. While I was in school, I had the opportunity to, when I was a junior, to listen to Bob Barkley speak about prevention in dentistry, and it really made a big impression on me. And after I got out of school, I had a rotating dental internship at Martin Army Hospital in Fort Benning, Georgia, and then after that, at that I went into a uh, uh, what we then would call a one-man duty station, but now we'd call a one-person duty station, in uh, Herlong, California, which is where Sierra Army Depot was. And so I got an opportunity to basically uh, be my own per own person in this clinic. And anyway, when I got out of there, I actually went into practice um, in the, my, my hometown of Myrtle Creek, which is a small community of about 3,000 people in Southern Douglas County. There were three dentists for about 25,000 people, and I was a new guy in town, and I had the new technology and the new knowledge, supposedly. And I was very interested in all of the disease that I saw in my community members and how we could work at preventing it. So I worked at it. Uh, you know, I did the traditional preventive things uh, that we you do, uh, fluoride, brushing, flossing, um, talking to people about being able to keep their teeth rather than lose them and all the things we do. And I practiced there for 20 years. And um, I sold my practice for various reasons, which I won't get into, uh, and was going to go to Central Oregon because I just like Central Oregon. But in the interim, uh, my daughter got got started getting, my youngest daughter started having problems and because uh, her mother and I had separated and my father was having health injuries. And so I decided to stay in Douglas County. And the one, the one thing that... Uh, the one group of people that needed care that, uh, so when I went to Roseburg, I got involved with the Medicaid population. Um, about to say, coincidentally, about the same time, the uh, state of Oregon decided to uh, uh, expand Medicaid, expand Medicaid to include adults and, um, and do it through managed care. And this was about 1989, uh, 1990. And, um, during this time, um, I was taking care of the Medicaid population. And I was learning about what the issues were uh, around the Medicaid population: is they don't keep their appointments, they have a they don't they don't they don't take care of themselves, they don't comply very well to your instructions, they uh, uh, they're not used to having care. They only come when they have a problem. They, by and large, are phobic and afraid of the dentist, and they bring their whole family. Uh, they have a tendency to uh, uh, not have the same uh, uh, hygiene uh, uh, hygiene requirements uh, that uh, the typical uh, typical population you would work with has. And they have a lot of issues. And the big deal was that nobody would participate because the, the billing system that the state used was so onerous uh, that uh, you could bill and bill and bill and bill, and if you didn't get it just right, they wouldn't pay you. And when they did pay, it was slow, and they would pay about, uh, you know, 35, 40 cents on the dollar for what you normally would get. And so through this process of dealing with the Medicaid population at that time, what we used to call them the welfare population, uh, I, 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 got to, I found out people in the Medicaid uh, uh, bureaucracy that were helpful, uh, I, uh, I, uh, they, were, they were so desperately needing people to take care of Medicaid people, especially in Douglas County. And so I worked with, I got to work with the system and I found about, I found out a lot about the system and I found out a lot about the population. And so uh, because it was the only population that I could treat, I learned a lot about them. Well, when they could pass the Medicaid population, they were going to do it uh, through managed care and uh, they were going to fund it in a different way. Uh, I... Uh, I was at a uh, at a uh, uh, dental society meeting, and at the end of the dental society uh, meeting, we were sitting around the table having a beer, talking about the things dentists commiserate about. Uh, I asked one question, which is, I know we, what we disagree upon, but can we do we agree upon anything at all? And, and because managed care was also coming to town about the same time, uh, on the commercial side, about the same time that the state of Oregon was getting into managed care on the uh, Medicaid side. And so I asked one question, is, is it, what can we agree upon? And we agreed upon three things, which is, first of all, 
Uh, Manny's care was here to stay. Secondly, if we didn't hang together in some format, we'd certainly hang separate. And lastly, uh, most significantly, is we agreed that the state of Oregon gave us a license to take care of everybody, not just those with money, and or money and means, and the ability to use the system that we currently were using at the time, which is you got a problem, you go to the dentist and he fixes it, or you go to the dentist to see if you got a problem, uh, and if he finds it, he fixes it. And uh, and the bigger the thing to fix, the more he got paid. Uh, so we. Uh, we had this conversation and uh, what we really realized was is that we really needed a system to where we could provide access to care to all the citizens in our community, not just those with money and means, and that would work for the Medicaid population and for the uninsured. Uh, and so we started exploring alternative ways of looking at things. First thing we did was put up a thousand, we, we talked at the Dental Society meeting afterwards there's three, about 30 of us, and we agreed that we needed to do something, so we put up $1,000 each. We hired a local guy who had a, a medical management company to do a business plan for us. Out of that business plan came a funding requirement, and we all put up another $6,000. And with that $200,000 plus, we uh, uh, formed a company. And we got our license uh, in dental insurance on the commercial side and our license to be a contracted Medicaid provider, and there were 30 of us in the owner. Well, then we had to get organized. We had to get a, uh, you know, structure. Uh, we had a lot of conversations about how what we're going to do and how we're going to go about it. But what we realized was is that <clears throat> that we, we realized all the issues that I had learned and we had all learned about why we didn't participate in Medicaid. Is that the system just didn't work, and so we either consciously or subconsciously withdrew from uh, treating Medicaid folks because the system we used was a colossal failure. And so we started thinking about, well, how would we do this if to, to make it successful? And we realized that we needed to pay different. We needed to pay different um, to be able to uh, get a different behavior. And so we decided to pay on a capitated basis. And so my really claim to fame is as I talked 30 dentists uh, into having a conversation about how we would treat Medicaid folks on a capitated basis. Uh, and that's 20 years ago, 21, 22 years ago, that was way ahead of its time. And what we basically formed back then was a dental accountable care organization, though we didn't know it. So uh, out of that process, one of the, th you know, I could spend a lot of time how we got organized, but I won't, because it's, the key point is, is uh, we, wanted to, we wanted to stress prevention because we knew we had to get the disease un under control because they had way more disease than we could fix. And very frankly, the benefit set didn't even cover this stuff. A lot of what we knew how to do, which was crowns, uh, bridges, and root canals. And, and it emphasized uh, uh, a prevention and dentures, basically, and extractions and fillings. So uh, through that process, what we realized was that um, traditional prevention that we use, uh, which requires motivational interviewing and uh, people changing the behavior, uh, basically didn't work. When you have a population that is uh, 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 chronically depressed, clinically depressed, you know, who can't even get hard to get out of bed in the morning, uh, how are you going to teach them how to brush and floss and uh, manage their disease? And what we realized was we had to look at how do we manage the population and help it get healthier while we work with the individuals to get their to get their disease under control and get them restored the best we could. Uh, one of the things we wanted to do was take some of the procedures out of the dentist's hands because if you if you if you if you put those in th those procedures in the dentist's hands they have a tendency to emphasize those rather than what you wanted to emphasize. So what we did is we settled upon a benefit set and worked with the state to where it covered the basics but didn't overcover things. Because if you cover everything, then the dentist spends all of his time uh, doing things that, uh, that are inappropriate, which is uh, fixing teeth rather than preventing disease. So when we realized that traditional uh, dental, dental disease doesn't work, we then started looking at and asking, basically we formulated the question, what would we do to get the population healthy without their compliance? And we started looking for alternative uh, uh, ways to do it. 
And in, 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 the, in the interim, we got involved with a uh, Robert Wood Johnson grant in Conda Falls uh, through a relationship, because uh, we have a group, we had a group down there, and um, I was invited to come down to participate in that group, as well as a, a, some 18 other organizations, including the, the uh, hygiene school, the, the health department, the, mental, the physical health department, the Department of Human Services, Head Start, the tribes, uh, to name a few, and, and, and we didn't. And what we did was, is, is we, uh, the, the question was, uh, how do we produce two-year-olds uh, two in Old Decay? Uh, and uh, through that process, we, I met Peter Milgram, and I uh, asked him if there was any way at all that we could get this disease under control and fix the cavities without having to restore them, because we had way more, way more teeth to restore then we had dentists to restore them or money to pay for the restorations, and it was a dismal failure. And that's when we uh, came across uh, the different various technologies that we can use to manage disease without drilling. Back. So there's really several sides to the, the, this story that you have to deal with. One of them is the science and, 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 and how, do you manage, how do you manage the disease, how do you manage the population, how do you fit within the regulations of the contract that you have. Uh, how do you do enough work? How do you? What work should you do? Uh, what makes the most sense with limited resources? Uh, we also have to circle back to the side about uh, the real question that we all had because we came from a fee-for-service model. Is how do you know? How do you know you're doing enough work? Because the uh, in a fee-for-service model you get paid for production. In a Medicaid model you get paid for uh, managing the population. So you're talking about uh, quality rather than output. So the outcomes versus output, output, and which is the new terms they talk about now, outcome, outcomes versus output. And so how did we, and one of our concerns, because we're a bunch of fee-for-service docs, is how we, you know, in managed care and Medicaid, how we know we're going to do enough work. So one of the things we had to do was really look at a system, uh, system uh, to do that. But first of all, there really was, you know, when we looked around to have a, uh, a technology to help us process claims and do all the stuff you need to, there really is nothing out there. And so what we did, we were working with the administrator that we worked with, is we hired uh, uh, computer people that basically uh, we outlined uh, what we wanted to do and they built the technology to allow us to accomplish that. And part of that is is the quality, the quality improvement things that we thought were important to look at. And one of them is how do we track uh, uh, how do we track what the dentist do in relationship to what he gets paid? Uh, uh, so how do we know if he's doing enough work, so to speak? And in the beginning, what we worried about was how much dentistry he did versus what he got paid to make sure that he wasn't just uh, uh, managing uh, by neglect, uh, by doing nothing. So we put a series of we put a series of uh, uh, quality improvement steps in place where we could track these things. We could track how much work he was doing, how, what types of work he was doing. Uh, we could measure we could measure complaints. We could measure what type of complaints, and whether that access issue, interpersonal relationship issues, or or whether it was a quality issue. We also could measure broken appointments, uh, missed appointments. We could measure people who showed up in the uh, uh, in the emergency call system. And we, get, we began to get a feel for uh, when a provider was actually, uh, was actually functioning where we needed to. As time went on, we began to realize that there were other things. Uh, the, the bad thing about the Oregon Health Plan was they really didn't know pre, they didn't, know, look, they didn't look at the population before we started. And so we really didn't know where we started from. And, and, and over time, they really, didn't ask, <clears throat> they really didn't ask a lot of outcome information from us. They mainly, team, mainly monitored complaints to see if people were complaining because they felt like that uh, the number one thing was they wanted is they didn't want people complaining to them about the fact they couldn't get access to care, or those kinds of things. And so we put in a very extensive case management system which manages the complaints, tracks the complaints, and we could tell, we could begin to tell uh, when a provider when a provider was managing uh, uh, how he was managed. And one of the things we, we also wanted to make sure is he didn't manage by he didn't manage by referral to the specialist. You know, our goal was is that we wanted we didn't want people to do things they weren't they weren't capable of doing, but we didn't want them to just send everything to the specialist so that they didn't have to do any work at all. So we put in a system, we put in a system that tracked referrals to specialists, and so we developed the sweet spot for how much dentistry 
uh, how much production needed to be done versus how much was referred out. And so those, those were our two measures that we measured that were most important in the beginning. Then we began to look at what kinds of what kinds of procedures did dentists do. Some dentists did, you know, would do heavy stuff, so therefore they wouldn't have to do the stuff that was needed, which was prevention. And about this time, we realized that the preventive techniques we were using just just weren't working that well. You know, getting people in, uh, doing prophies and fluorides, uh, teaching people how to brush and floss, uh, how to eat right, those kinds of things. Uh, uh, part of the problem with it is our no-show rate, the no-show rate, people not showing up their appointments, was was about 40 percent and so uh you know the dentist if, if you know if you're getting paid on a capitated basis and people don't show up you still get paid and so we had to have a system in place to make sure that the dentist weren't just seeing anybody and so we put in a whole no-show uh what we call a no-show where we track uh people no-show and if the dentist didn't use the system we could tell that because we could tell he had to report when he had a no-show into our system and we developed the website system to do that well, during this process, we uh, we realized that we needed to have the technology where we could work together. So we actually built a website that we all use, that we all could use, even though we had separate software packages. We had a, a system to where we could uh, work together based in the web, and eventually it went to a cloud-based system because uh, as the technology evolved and all the things that go with it. And I can talk about that later. But very frankly, we had to build the system to work together. We had to build the economic model. And then we, what we did is, is uh, to build an incentive is we actually made it so that if you, made, if you met certain goals, we withheld some money. Part of it was just fat business position because in Oregon, uh, in Oregon uh, uh, it's a 10 to, one, 10, 10 to 1 rule where for every uh, $10 in premiums, you have to have one in reserve. And one of the ways to uh, lessen that is to put the providers at risk. Uh, put the providers at risk. And so what we did is we built a risk-based model uh, really out of the fact we didn't have a lot of capital because we put up the money ourselves. One thing I forgot to mention on is all of us, I guess I did mention it, we put up that 7000 each. And then then we uh, uh, we this spread across the, the re, across the state to seven different regions. And so we had seven local groups of dentists who worked together in one in one company with a common board and we raised about three million dollars out of 300 dentists uh, and capitalized the company. Uh, two and a half million of that went into reserves, one on the commercial side because we did have a commercial insurance license. And the goal was to get to the table and have some say about what happened to us and have some input in what went on in our community. Because we realized that we needed to have a system to where we could actually be involved with the community and get to the table and have some say professionally about about what was going on because what we saw was most of the healthcare system was driven by business guys and insurance companies uh, or their representatives even on the commercial side and the, the Medicaid side uh, it was basically a commercial model and we just didn't like it mean, didn't like it because it didn't allow us to uh, it did not allow us to to really be able to use the science in, in, in our doctoring in a way that made sense. Because very frankly, we knew 20 years ago, 22 years ago, that a discounted fee-for-service system on a Medicaid population whose disease was out of control and didn't have the behaviors needed to manage that disease, it wouldn't work. And, and so what we, we also realized is that there's a whole set of problems when you go to a capitated a global budgeted, what we now call it global budgeting system that we need to put in. So you have to have checks and balance in every system. In a uh, fee-for-service system, the abuse can be over-treatment, inappropriate treatment, uh, and in a, a capitated system, it can be under-treatment and, very frankly, inappropriate treatment. So you have to have a system to monitor those, and we built those. Uh, one of the thing, nice things about it is we built that system. As time, as time went on, <clears throat> So we put this we put this incentive system in place, and at the end of the year, if everybody met the metrics, then they got their withhold back, and it was a combination between uh, um, doing enough work, or not over referral, not over referring to the specialist, uh, making sure that uh, you manage the population uh, in a way that uh, uh, gave good care. So it's, we were kind of doing a version of the triple aim back in the day of what was the patient experience. Uh, did they get healthier, and could we uh, manage the cost in a more effective way? 
And we were able to do that because I don't know what most people don't realize is that adult dental, the experiment that Oregon had going on, was uh, was uh, optional with the federal government. And so every two years, uh, the government would have a, uh, uh, a budget crisis, and so they would suggest we cut adult dental. So what we did is we spent a lot of time at the legislature First of all, getting the legislature to understand that uh, if you cut out adult dental, it's going to cost you money, not save you money. And we were effective at that because the legislature doesn't offer to get rid of dental anymore. But part of the what, part of what we did was is, is we uh, we took the we, we took the advantage of the fact that the Medicaid spend for dental went from 14 percent of the total spend to six, and we used it to to refine the benefit set and make the system better. So I personally believe today we have a we have a better system and it costs the state less money uh, as a percent of the budget. So we uh, we were able to get the benefits to where we just covered the essential things, not everything. And if you do that, if you cover the essential things, uh, and, and then and then you can then begin a program that um, makes sense. And let me interject a question, mm -hmm. Mike, because um, I'd like to know who was in charge of running this company. Maybe before you wrap this up, maybe you can talk about the fact that dentists built this and run it. Yeah, um, and I kind of mentioned, I kind of mentioned, Steve asked the question, who's in charge of this? And I kind of made, I kind of mentioned it in that we dentists want to get to the table and have some say. Uh, all too often you have the physicians, you have the hospitals, uh, you have some mental health, uh, and you have the specialists and the physicians. But and, and our whole system is centric is uh, hospital centric, and that's because they get forty to fifty percent of the spend. And like I talked about, uh, we sit around in our little factories. I, don't, I guess I didn't talk about it. Steve and I talked about it earlier. But what we do, we have the American system is is we sit around in our little factories, waiting for people with problems to show up. The bigger the problem, the bigger the problem, the more we get paid. The biggest little factory in our healthcare system is called is called a hospital. You know, and uh, they're the most expensive piece of the hospital. They take 40 to 50 percent of the spend. Because they get so much money, they're able to hire the talent. And so everybody kind of bows down to the hospital. And I don't say that in a bad way. They kind of bow down to the hospital because who wants a bad hospital when you need one? Who wants a bad uh, emergency room when you need one? And so we need good hospitals because, very frankly, our things happen to us. But do we need as much hospital as we need? And very frankly, if all of us providers did our job, all of us healthcare workers, all of us mental health workers, all of us public health officials, if all of us did our job, we wouldn't need as much hospital. Because what we have is the hospitals uh, uh, spending a lot of time on the end of disease on people that have chronic diseases, heart disease, diabetes, asthma, uh, uh, all of these things uh, uh, that, that, smoke, that are related to smoking and are related to diabetes and related to diet and exercise. A lot of the things we see in the hospital are the end result of those disease. In fact, if I remember the statistics correctly, that 80% of the healthcare dollars are spent in the last two years of people's life. And that's a, that's a pretty inefficient system. And dentistry is no different. You know, we have better and better and better technology because the incentives are to, to develop better and better ways to replace teeth so people can replace things that have been damaged and lost. So we have implants, we have bridges, we have really fancy technology. Uh, we are really, really good in dental. We can glue stuff to stuff in the, in the presence of moisture. I mean, it's amazing what we can do. But it's still, at the end of the day, you're still, you're still diseased and you're still uh, infected and you're still repaired. And you're not as healthy, you're just repaired. And so that system that, that you know, it's not unusual to have a treatment plan anymore, uh, the dentist offer treatment plan of $40,000, $50,000. Well, if you have uh, $23 million on Medicaid and the state, the, the federal government and the state governments are paying for it, and you're talking about a system that could spend forty dollars or $50,000 per person, you do the math. It's trillions of dollars. There's just not enough resources. And so uh, in a global budget system, where's the best? How do you, how do you make a profit inside a fixed system? You do that but with innovation, uh, with disrupting the old system, by coming up with new scientific uh, uh, or even old scientific knowledge reapplied in a way that allows you to have healthier people. If the, if the question now is not how many people have been fixed, and not how many people have gone to the dentist and been fixed, if the question now is 
how many people uh, uh, do not have a cavity? How many people graduate from high school with no, with no cavities? Uh, if that's now the standard, and a, and, a, and a cavity and a filling is a failed outcome, if that's the question, what would you do different? How would you apply the knowledge different? Rather than picking up the drill to solve the problem, uh, what would you pick up in its place if you didn't have a drill? And so those are the kinds of questions that came to us as uh, in, a, in a fixed system if we want people to be healthy. And what we realized was you have a, a, a group of people who have an infection that's out of control, that don't have the behaviors or the resources needed to use the paradigm that's designed to fix the problem. And it doesn't work. And so what we started looking at because of the fact that we were in this closed system, uh, are there different ways of doing it? We started asking the question, are there different ways of doing this? Yeah, another piece of the story uh, is the whole, the whole political, kind of like a political piece and the politics of the Dental Association and, and, and the politics of the uh, uh, of healthcare in Oregon and the fact that we had a governor who was a physician who used to be an emergency room physician who thought it was criminal that we spent all the money on and he tells the story when he was at the university uh, it was in Denver the university at the hospital in Denver general where he had an elderly lady who wanted to go home and die and he wouldn't let her and they spent a million dollars and they had a uh, pregnant uh, girl who had a preemie baby that cost a million dollars because she couldn't get any care. So you spend a million dollars on somebody who wanted to die and you spend a million dollars on a baby that could have been prevented. And what he thought that that was a criminal system. And so he became an emergency room physician in a town uh, 15 miles from where I lived. And uh, because I was acting as a dental association and I knew the executive director and I was at that time probably the president of the association, the local dental society, I was a trustee or whatever because I was always active in the association. The executive director, Barry Rice, call, would call, the, the governor would have some of the, he was a state, became a state senator in, in Douglas County. And one of the things he didn't like was the fact that people would come to, adults would come to the hospital with toothaches because they couldn't find a dentist that would treat them because there was no system for that. So Barry Rice would call me, uh, the, the, the state center would call the dental association, the dental association would call me and I'd find somebody to take care of this person's tooth. Through that I developed a relationship with uh, the state senator who eventually became a governor. Uh, and uh, he came up with a system to uh, how we could have a, and she, what his goal was, was to have insurance for everybody. People on Medicaid, small businesses have insurance and big businesses have insurance. And he talked about this and they passed the legislation uh, in 86, 87, 88, 89 and this legislation got passed in 89 to be implemented in 94. And uh, through that process, uh, I got to know him well uh, he really felt like the adult dental ought to be covered in a way so that people didn't have to go to the emergency room. And very frankly, they didn't call the governor and complain about the fact they couldn't have access to care. And so uh, through that, I became, uh, you know, I, uh, that and other circumstances because I was active, I got appointed to a lot of committees. And through that process of being appointed to those committees, I actually got involved with the development of the what we now call the Affordable Care Act or the Healthcare Transformation in Oregon. The whole, the stuff that Don Berwick and his think tank way back when, over 20 years, came up with of the triple aim, which is better, a better patient experience or better care, uh, to have better health or a better outcome at a better cost or lower cost, basically a better cost because you're really not lowering the cost, we're lowering the increase, so it's a better cost. And so that whole process, well, I got involved and I was appointed, I was on the Medicaid Advisory Committee, I was just kind of, the timing was right for me to be involved. And what I found, what I, what I heard them say, them being the people that were talking about it is, 30% of what we're doing isn't necessary, 50% of what they want done isn't getting done, and the system comes back every year and wants another 15, 20%, and which is not sustainable. What has happened over time is uh, the government, and I call the government, the cities, the counties, the special districts, the schools, uh, 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 the state, Medicaid, Medicare, the tribes, 
uh, military, those are all governmental ent entities in Oregon, now pay 65 to 70% of the health care bill. So as the health care bill got paid more and more by governmental entities, which very frankly have short resources because they're limited by how many taxes they can collect, uh, didn't like the delivery system because like I just described, 30% uh, of what they uh, was getting done wasn't necessary, 50% what they wanted done. And so what happened is, is the knowledge, with the knowledge boom and the ability to access knowledge through the systems that we now have, a lot of people understand what good health is and what good outcomes are. And the government started to intrude into healthcare more and more because they didn't like what they saw and they, didn't get, they weren't getting with the money that they were spending. And so they were looking at how do we transform the delivery system into something that makes more sense. And I was a big part of that whole process uh, because I was the oral health representative uh, to sit at the table uh, to have be part of the discussion that developed the legislation in Oregon. So given that experience, given that experience uh, and uh, having a system that very frankly uh, is a global budgeted system based upon outcomes, even though our outcomes were rudimentary, we had the system that allowed us to begin to do it in the database system and the, and the, re, and the electronic system and the whole thought process around, uh, around uh, 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 global budgeting and outcome-based, uh, provider-based. Uh, so what happened is Oregon uh, formed with a, their account, an Oregon's version of accountable care organization is called a coordinated care organization. It's the biggest experiment in the world on the planet of uh, integrated accountable care organization where we integrate oral health, physical health, and behavioral health together. And so I was pretty instrumental, instrumental in that. And as it turns out, um, we're in all 16 CCOs, coordinated care organizations. And uh, uh, what has happened is, is, is it, <coughs> We had to relook, like I said earlier, we had to relook at the science. We had to relook at how we're doing things. Uh, uh, and we had to do this in the face of, uh, of a system that everybody's embedded in, which is the uh, fee-for-service um, system, where the incentives are producing things. In fact, I gave a lecture here a while back at a, a, national, a national convention, and when I outlined what we needed to be doing, the... Um, the first, the, one of the big providers in the country, the first thing they did when they stood up was, how are we going to know if we, how, if we do enough work? Which was the same question we had 22 years ago. So very frankly, we built a system that allows us to answer that question as well as, as well as uh, uh, other questions we might have about what kind of work should we do and what kind of outcomes we're getting. Uh, so <sighs> one of the things we plan to do is, is there are a lot, there's a lot, is a relook at the science. And there are a lot of, and what we found is there, we needed new technologies to fight this infection uh, and the re results of it, which is the cavity. You've got to remember, this is an oral infection. This passed usually from the primary caregiver to the child, usually the mother, within the first six months of the child's life. And once infected, you don't get to, you don't, you don't get to prevent the infection. You get to prevent the results of the infection. So you can control the disease, but you can't prevent it. And the, the, the whole system we use is, is once you're infected, because if I were, and I've, I can't tell you, probably 50 times I've been in front of a group and I ask them one question, has anybody in the room never had a filling? In a room of 100, there'll always be one, maybe two. So one or 2% of the people have never had a filling. And so everybody is infected. Everybody's infected. And and, and what, what happens is, is, People who are able to use a dental health system, the oral health system, because the number one thing is shown to help keep disease under, under control, not prevented, but under control, is going to the dentist on a regular basis, having a dental home. The problem with a dental home today, when you have a, a, a big technology, is that the dentists have a tendency to, um, to offer big treatment plans. And if you have a lot of disease and you get a big treatment plan and you don't have the resources, guess what you do? You never go back. You say you don't have any insurance because the first thing out of your mouth is, well, I don't go to the dentist because I don't have any insurance. Well, very frankly, uh, and the reason they say that, and, and, and then the second thing is, is that 
when people go to the dentist and need a lot of work, the first thing they do is call their insurance agent if they have the, the they know how to do that and see if they can get insurance to cover the repair. Because people think of insurance to cover repair because in our system, repair is repair is what you get when you go to the dentist. Nobody ever thinks about. I shouldn't say nobody. It's a big word. Very few people think about why do I have this disease. It's about we need access to care. We need access to the dentist. Well, what does the dentist do? The dentist repairs. He doesn't really get paid for prevention. And the prevention that he does get paid for doesn't work very well on somebody. It only works if you go and go on a regular basis and do what they tell you there. But if you don't go because you got so much repair work that's needed and your disease is so big, you don't go. Therefore, the preventive system doesn't work. So what we began to look at is, is how do we get a disease in a population under control without their compliance? And then when we ask the question, how do you do that? There are things to do that. And then when we began to, one of the big realizations that came to me was dentistry works on, we, we're down in the mouth working on a single tooth, figuring out how we can fix each single tooth. We never think about Rarely do we think about how does oral health disease impact the rest of the community. And it's the overall spend in the healthcare system. Where do people with dental disease use the community healthcare system in an inappropriate way? It didn't enter my mind because we're, we're worrying about each individual tooth and each individual patient. And we don't worry about, well, what about the population and how is it impacting the rest of the community? You know, how many people are going to the hospital ED and, and using that as a way to take care of their dental disease? How many people are getting treated in the OR because their dental disease is such is so severe or they have health histories, health issues that are so severe or they have phobias that were developed because they, as a kid because they got traumatized because they had disease in an early age. And, and then how many people are getting prescriptions and drugs inappropriate that they wouldn't need? How many people are getting antibiotics and pain pills that if they didn't have any disease, they wouldn't have? How many people are missing school because they have two things? How many people are missing work? How many people's lives are getting damaged and they fail to thrive because they continually, every couple, three years, have to go to the dentist uh, because their disease is so overwhelming? And then how many people become uh, what I call... Uh, disabled. How many people, I used to call it crippled, but we don't use that word anymore. How many dental disabled people do we have that don't have any teeth? Because your lifestyle, very frankly, if you have a healthy mouth with no disease and don't need, and don't need any fillings and you have your own teeth, your health is a lot better. Your life is a lot better. Your lifestyle is a lot better than if you, if you, um, if you have uh, no teeth. In fact, I was talking to a dentist uh, yesterday who had the experience of a fellow who came in who had dentures with no ridge and a artificial limb on his leg. And the dentist, for some reason, asked him, what, what would he rather have, no teeth or no leg? And he said, I would rather have no leg than no teeth. It's a lot easier to deal with without, with the loss of a limb than there's a loss of the teeth. That's a pretty powerful statement. And so what we're doing is, is we, we yeah, we're fixing people and we ended up, they have teeth that can smile and chew and we can anchor them with artificial deals, but it takes a lot of money to get there, a lot of misery, a lot of heartache, a lot of failure to thrive, a lot of resources that if you could prevent the disease, not control it over time, uh, then you wouldn't uh, have to do, you wouldn't have to be in that situation. So one of the things we started looking at, because I was, I was, was talking to Steve about uh, uh, Oregon uh, did the Medicaid expansion. And the Medicaid expansion put on 500,000 adults in Oregon. And I've been doing some research looking at our treatment plans, and I would suspect, I'm just going to say the average treatment plan at the average fee of the 500,000 people is about two, is about $2,000. That's a billion dollars and it, that would need it to fix all of the teeth, if it was 2000 if you fixed them back with what we know today with the fees that are charged. Even if you charged half, it'd still be $500 million. They're going to pay us about $141 million 
So very frankly, it's not enough resources. The problem's gotten so big, there's no resources to be, not enough resources to fix our way out of this problem. And that's where we were early on in the system when we realized that the preventive system that we're using does not work. That is to teach each individual person to change their behavior, to begin to, use, to do the things needed to prevent their disease. Change their diet, brush and floss, go to the dentist on a regular basis, get all the teeth, but never mind. They don't have the money to fix all their teeth back to where the dentist wants to offer them because the dentists are obligated to tell them what they need using the technology and science that we have when it comes to restorative dentistry. So what we began to look at is how do we break the cycle? And where, how do we break the cycle? What science would we use? And where would we apply that science? And who should do it? Because waiting in our little factories for people to show up with their problems is, is too late in the system. And, I, and, and so how would we break the cycle early on? So if we could break the population cycle so we didn't have to spend money on kids, and we could begin to produce uh, 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 children with no decay that could graduate with no decay, if we do that, then all of a sudden we've saved a huge amount of money. We've got people who are much healthier with a better experience because they don't have to be filled. I mean, very frankly, if you never have to fill in, you've got a better experience because you don't have to sit in a chair. You don't have to have an injection. You don't have to have your tooth drilled on. You don't have to have an extraction. You don't have to have an abscess. Uh, you don't have to have any of that stuff. So if we could break that cycle, and very frankly, the science is here. It's just we've, uh, we don't use it because there was no incentive in the current financing system we are using, which is to pay the dentist to fix teeth, uh, to do that. But when you change it around the global budget and you can begin to look at how we break the cycle, and you can do that with a group of doctors who can use science uh, and can help the, and sit down with the communities, because I feel, really feel that dentistry is in charge of oral health. We have to step up to our responsibility. We are not technicians. We are doctors. We ought to step up in our community and use science in our doctoring skills, which is doctor do no harm. And we can sit down with our communities and we be part of the discussion to develop a system with our communities about how we can have better overall health as well as better oral health. And that's our rightful place. We have a license. The state has charged us with that, with that and we've been negligent, mainly because the system we use incentivize us in a way that doesn't make sense. And what we've done in our system is, is, is to figure out how we can uh, uh, do that. And the thing you got to remember is we still need to fix teeth. Dentists are the ones that fix teeth. So while we're fixing teeth and we're trying to make it so we have fewer teeth to fix, how do we sit down with the community? How do we sit down with the community uh, in a way that makes sense. Um, I'll begin, uh, you know, I kind of re interrupted this train of thought. I, one of the things about me is I, uh, I think best on my feet. Uh, more pressure there is, the better I think. And so doing an interview like this is actually uh, uh, good because uh, it's hard for me to esoterically talk about, think about something, write it down, those kinds of things. I really appreciate the opportunity to do it this way. Uh, Steve's got a real good skill set. He's a great editor and and uh, good writer. And very frankly, I'm a good thought guy and I can articulate it pretty well. I have to tell the story to be able to, um, you know, really be able to tell it. So I appreciate the opportunity to tell the story. Um, when you have a population that the disease is out of control, you have a population who don't have the behaviors needed to use the current system nor the resources to use the current system, and their disease load is so overwhelming that they, that, that really the fact that their disease load is so large really is a barrier to the current system. And so when you talk about they're gonna pay 14 cents on the dollar to solve the problem, you're not gonna find any providers that are gonna be able to even afford to be able to participate. And what you're gonna do is have groups, uh, accountable care organizations, a group of people that you play a block of money that can then look and then look at it in a different way and can integrate that because you really need the help of behavioral health. You know, behavioral health the goal ought to be it is to help you manage the behaviors of the people so they therefore can use the science 
to use the science and, and, and you're going to be able to need to, you're going to need the rest of the physical health care system, the hospitals, the physicians, the specialists, you're going to need them to allow you to use the science in a different place, very frankly, in your pla in their places, because well, people, dentists wait around the little factories and people don't get there. And you can say, well, let's place the hospital, let's place the little hospitals in the hospital. We still got the problem. You still have the problem is you got too much disease. The solution.